it's going to be hotter if you're in hell. They wake up in a devil's hell. So praise God that Jesus Christ got us out of that. Amen. Amen. We don't have to worry about that. We don't have to worry about that thanks to Jesus Christ. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 11 this morning. We're going to start out in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. I don't know if this is a true story or not. Y'all can take it or leave it, believe it or not. But I was I heard that Biden wanted to go get a blessing from the Pope. Why don't y'all start laughing? Like, it's a, like, y'all don't know if this is true or not. So Biden heads over to go get a, he wanted to get a blessing from the Pope. And before, right before he walked in, they were worried about him. Because you know Biden, he'll get lost going to the bathroom. So they send Kamala in there with him. So Kamala and Biden go in there and they're waiting for the Pope to sh- show up. And uh, Kamala being Kamala, she's got a big old bag of peanuts. And she's eating these peanuts and she's cracking these peanut shells and throwing them on the ground and eating the peanuts. And Biden said, you're always embarrassing me. You're always embarrassing me. He said, but whatever you do, don't, do, don't get in the way of me getting my blessing. And she's, you know, with her big old laughing, big old horse smile. I ain't going to do nothing like that, you know. But she goes over there and... Biden's looking at some of the beautiful paintings in the Vatican as they're waiting for the Pope to show up. And about that time, he looks down the hallway, and there's Kamala, and uh, the Pope's there, and the Pope's blessing her. And Biden's real upset, and Biden runs over there and says, You took away my blessing. You took away my blessing. You got my blessing because the Pope leaves before Biden can get over there. He took away my blessing. You took away my blessing. And he said, What did the Pope say to you? What did he bless you with? She goes, I, I don't know. She said that, he just come up and he said, you idiot, you pick up those shells and you take that other idiot and you get out of here. <laughs> yeah. You idiot, you pick up those shells and you get the other idiot and you get out of here. Yeah. I hope you didn't vote for Biden because I could have used Trump in there if you wanted me to. Trump and pants up. That's the story I heard. Take it or leave it. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. This is the chapter of the heroes of the faith. The heroes of the faith. Great chapter of faith and the heroes of the faith and what they've done in their faith in Jesus Christ, their faith in the Lord God and how he moves. And of course, our faith in Jesus Christ is applied to that. And look at Hebrews chapter 11. Look at verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And we, we know that according to Genesis, that God created, that through spiritual ways, created this world, and we know Jesus Christ by his word, created this world, and of course Jesus Christ being the Word created all things, and it being the Word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Even if you're not a believer, even if you're in here, or you uh, listen to us and you're an atheist, you have to agree that that, that verse right there lines up with scientific facts, because we know that atoms and the nucleus and all the molecules, all those things that go below that we can't see with our naked eye, that's what, things, that, that's what the world's made out of. So this Bible's scientifically accurate. Every time you come across it. All right, verse 4. Verse 4. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. So I want to preach this morning on a more excellent sacrifice, because it says there that Abel offered unto God a more excellent, excellent, a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And when he did, he obtained a witness that he was righteous. So God testified that Abel was righteous, that Cain was unrighteous. And why? Because Abel, he offered unto God a more excellent, a more excellent sacrifice. Hey, Brother Wade, do you mind praying over this sermon, please, Brother? Thank you. Yes. Yes, Lord. Amen, amen. All right, let's turn to Genesis chapter 4. All right, let's go look at this story of Cain and Abel. Let's find out about this more excellent sacrifice. A more excellent 
sacrifice. Genesis chapter 4, we're going to pick this story up. Let's read it together this morning, and let's find out how Abel's sacrifice was a more excellent sacrifice. And we're going to pick this story up in Genesis chapter 4. This is where this story is written, where we find out about Cain and Abel. Genesis chapter 4, we're going to start there at verse 1, if you want to turn there with me. Follow along, and we're going, to, we're going to read this story together, and I'm going to preach about a more excellent, a more excellent sacrifice. And Adam knew Eve, his wife. Now this, of course, is right after the fall and after God had put, made the covenant with Adam and Eve. And, and Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. Now, we, don't, we can't prove this beyond shadow of a doubt, but it hints to that Cain and Abel were twins. There's a hint there. There's, you, you, you don't have to believe it. It's nothing that's doctrinally going to change anything, but it hints there that maybe Cain and Abel were twins. And she again bears brother Abel, verse 2. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain was a tiller of the ground. It said Abel was a shepherd. It's amazing when you study the Bible that God calls a lot of shepherds. God calls a lot of shepherds. Moses was a shepherd at the end when God called him. David was a shepherd. Uh, Amos, a lot of these men of God were a shepherd. And of course, we got, amen, the good shepherd, Jesus Christ, who's our good shepherd. So you see God's real partial to shepherds. And uh, Abel was a shepherd, a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. There's nothing wrong with being a farmer. It's, farmer is a, is a, is a great uh, profession. I love farmers. I love farming myself. I love being around farmers. But you don't see God calling a lot of farmers in the Bible. A lot, a lot, there's a little difference there. But Cain was a farmer. Abel was a shepherd. Verse 3. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the first things of the flock and of the fat thereof. So it says, verse 3, and in the process of time, so they knew there's coming a time that they were supposed to go sacrifice to God. Now notice this is real recent to when man was created, uh, maybe hundreds of years, but in, 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 relatively, it's right there when God had created, was walking with Adam and Eve in the cool of the Garden of the Eden, and they, uh, they had direct contact with God, the Lord God, and they knew there was a time that God wanted them to come and to sacrifice to him, that wanted to come and bring their sacrifice to them. It's a process of time, so we don't know what that time was, but there was a time they knew they had to show up, and they were going to bring their sacrifices to God and offer them to God. And Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering. So he's bringing a sacrifice of works by sweat. He brings, an, he brings his sacrifice. Cain's sacrifice to God is an offering of works he worked the ground. He tilled the ground. It was, a, it was an offering of works by sweat. Verse 4, And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of fat thereof. And Abel brings a sacrifice of blood through faith. So there's the contrast. And you're going to see this contrast as we go through the story that Abel is bringing a sacrifice of blood. He brings of the flock of the firstlings of his flock, the, the young lamb, and of the fat thereof, the, be, the fat thereof there in the Bible means the best. It's the best. It's the, it's the, it's the good stuff. It's the, he's, Abel's bringing the firstlings of, the, of his flock, at, flock and then the fat thereof. It's a sacrifice of blood through faith. And as you see from the beginning of time, there's been two separate factions. There's been a faction that brings to God a sacrifice of works through sweat. They're working their way to God. They're trying to do these things through, through their flesh, trying to work their way, trying to please God, trying to get righteousness with God, trying to get atonement, make one with God through works through sweat. And there's been, a, there's been another fraction that comes in, and they're, they're trying to get to God and sacrifice blood through faith, sacrificing their, this blood of this animal, saying this animal, this, the animal, this blood of this animal is a sacrifice to you, Lord God, to make us a one and to make by faith I'm trusting this will make me right with you. No works. No works on this side. It's blood through faith. This side is works through sweat. And God said through the Bible in Hebrews 11 it was a more excellent 
sacrifice. It's a more excellent. And Abel, he also brought the first things of the flock, of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and, his, and to his offering, he had not respect. He didn't respect Cain's offering. He didn't respect it. And you wonder why. You say, that's a more excellent sacrifice. And the Bible says it. It's a more, Abel's was a more excellent sacrifice. But the question comes up is why? Why was that a more excellent sacrifice? Because in man's eyes, and I know in the world's eyes, but not as Christians, y'all know why, but in the world's eyes and in man's eyes, and maybe some of you Christians in here, you're thinking, why wouldn't God accept that sacrifice? Because Cain had done all that work. He had tilled that ground. He had done, he put, he put his sweat, blood, and tears into that. He did all this work to get to God to try to make it. And he presented him this, this fruit of his labor and all the work he had been doing. And he presented it to God. He'd really worked really, really hard. And God, God says, I'm not happy with that. And here's Abel, he just comes up with this lamb, he slits the lamb's throat, he takes that blood, he says, God, here's the offering to you. And God says, I respect that. It's a more excellent sacrifice. So the question arises is why? Why was it a more excellent sacrifice? You've got to ask yourself that. Keep your hand here, but turn to Leviticus chapter 17, and I'll show you why. Now we're going to jump ahead. If you're in, you're in Genesis, it'll be Genesis, Exodus, and then you'll come across Leviticus. Turn to Leviticus chapter 17. So God's going to tell Moses why that, this is a, that, that Abel's was a more excellent sacrifice. So God, Mo, God's going to tell Moses here in Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11 why Abel's sacrifice was a more excellent sacrifice. Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11. The Lord had respected Abel's sacrifice. He said, this is what I want. Why, why would God do that? Look at verse 11. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. For the life, and this is what God tells Moses, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. Amen. 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 You, 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 can admit, you can understand that. Anybody, I don't care if you're in here and you're an atheist and you don't believe, but listen to me, you can understand it. That's scientifically accurate. The problems we have is with our blood. Just talking to a brother here. We were just talking this morning. He's, he's on blood thinners. He's giving him trouble. All our problems is with the blood. And they deal with us through the blood. It, it affects our blood. Cancer is affected through the blood. The blood's through the cancer. It's the blood. And the life of the flesh is in the blood. And if your blood is bad, you're in a bad shape. Amen. And if your blood is good, you're in pretty good shape. But when you run out of blood, you run out of life. The life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. He said that blood is the life of the flesh, and when that blood is given to me, it makes me and you at one. It makes it one meant. It pays. For the sin. It makes us at one minute. It covers the sin. It covers the problems. It makes us to me and you can get to get at. At one minute. Makes us at one minute. Puts us together. That blood does that. And that blood is the live flesh. That blood that's running through us. That's what's keeping us alive. He said that's what makes it one between me and you. Explain that pastor. I can't hardly explain it. But that's how God wants it. And that's how he wanted it from the beginning. And I believe that Cain and Abel knew that. And I'm going to show you, even if God didn't tell them that very verse right there, verse 11, they could have had a hint that that's how God seen it. You say, well, how do you, what do you mean that? Turn back. Now, let's go back to Genesis. Go back to Genesis. Now, we're going back to Genesis chapter 4, but now let's go back just a little bit further back to Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve fell. Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. When Adam and Eve fell. Let's go back. And I'm going to show you that there was two ways and that God had chosen this one way through the blood and Abel figured it out. Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. After Adam and Eve fell, they're naked. Their sin is shown. Right? They're naked and they're, they're ashamed and their sin is shown. 
Their nakedness, look at verse 21, chap, Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. This is that little bitty verse right there. And then it goes on and talks about some other stuff. Abel, even though he wasn't there, was told by his mom and dad that, yeah, after we ate that, after we ate that fruit and we could see ourselves were naked and we were ashamed, the Lord God, he cursed the ground. He cursed the serpent and put him on the ground. He cursed, the, he cursed Eve and said, when you bear children, you're going to bear it in sorrow. He, get, he gave us these curses. He said, I'm going to work by the sweat of my brows, what Adam's telling Abel. But then he tells Abel, but then he did something really curious. He brought out this sheep and he killed the sheep and then he took the, that sheep's skin and he made us covering to cover up our shame and nakedness. Something has to die because we sinned. And they were getting a hint of it right there in verse 21. And Adam also unto his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. It's just one little verse, but it speaks volumes of what's going to happen to the rest of the, to the, rest of the Bible. Something is going to die for your sin. And before Jesus comes, it's going to be the lamb. It's going to be goats. It's going to be bulls. It's going to be a little turtle dove. It's going to be something that's going to die because you're a sinner. And that's the only way we're going to get it won, God says. That's the only way. But from the beginning of time, you're seeing here in Genesis chapter 4, there's been two ways of thinking. There's been God's way. Something's got to die. Because you sin. And then there's man's way. I'm going to work, work, work and get right with God. And Cain says, I'm going to work, 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 sweat by the sweat of my brow and put in all this work. And he would see over there and he'd see Abel laying underneath the tree while the sheep are out there grazing, taking him a little siesta, amen. Not doing much work. And he'd getting up and he goes, okay, guys. And he'd lead the sheep over to the water and let them water. And he'd sit there and he'd take him a little drink of water. And Cain would be over there just laying down that hole. Just laying down another row. Just digging and swapping off the sweat. And he'd look over there and there's Abel over there petting one of his sheep. Laying there by the tree. Just taking a little siesta again. He's over here working and Abel's doing nothing. And then when Abel comes up and says, okay, here's the best of my lamb, he cuts that lamb's throat and he gives that blood to God and God says, I accept that. And Cain's over here and Cain's done all this hard work and he's been trying to please God and he wants to do something really nice for God and he's been sweating and working and working and working and he brings God the best of his fruit and God says, I don't want that. Verse 4 of Genesis 4. And Abel, he also brought of the first things of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. Cain got mad. Cain got jealous. Cain got angry. You know the world hates us for that very reason. The world can't stand it. Like Jesse Ventura, the famous wrestler that was the governor of uh, Minnesota, he said Christianity is nothing but a crutch. That's what he said about us Christians. You Christians, it's nothing but a crutch. No, no, Jesse. Christianity is not a crutch. It's my very life. It's my very breath. I can't go on without Jesus Christ. I've got to have Jesus Christ. He's more than a crutch to me. You don't get it. Because without the precious blood of Jesus Christ, I'm going to hell. But see, they think of this as a religion, as a work, and you've got to work and you go. And Cain sees that, and he looks over there at Abel, and he's like, he didn't do anything. And his countenance fell, and he got mad. He got very wroth. Verse 6, And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? Why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? God says, Hey, if you do the right thing, everything's going to be okay. If you don't do it the way I want it, things aren't going to be okay. Pretty simple. The world don't like that. The world likes to go out on their own. The world likes to do it on their own. A lot of people like to try to do it on their own. God says, no, I want it done this way. And if you do it well, all things will be well. 
God has a way that is well in his eyes. Let me say that again. God has a way that is well in his eyes. God has a way that's not well in his eyes. If you do the way that God thinks is well in his eyes, you will be accepted. If you do those things that's not well in his eyes, you won't be accepted. Here's the problem. It's a small way. It's one way. It's called the way for us Christians. For everybody in here this morning, it's called the way. His name is Jesus Christ. But it's that way. See, from the, from the beginning of time, God has said, you're not getting a participation trophy. Not everybody gets the prize. Not everybody gets a trophy. See, we're growing up in a society where we get them in T-ball, everybody's playing T-ball, and at the end, of, everybody gets a trophy. We don't keep score here, even though every dad out there, in the, out, there in the, out there on the other side of the fence is saying, yeah, we beat them 16 to 2. Oh, we're not keeping score here. Oh, yeah, we are. We're keeping score. No, no, we don't do that. because We don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. We want everybody to feel accepted. We want everybody to think that they did well. We want everybody to think that they're special. We want everybody, and we raise our kids up that way, and we raise our kids up that way, and God said from the very beginning, if you'll do well, won't you be accepted? I'm not giving out participation trophies, Cain. I'm not, I'm not going to say, oh, man, you really, really worked hard. Okay, I'll let you go ahead. and Come on, I'll, be, I'll go ahead and accept that. He said, no, I don't accept that, Cain. I want the blood because it's the blood. It's the life of the flesh. It's how I'm going to make atonement with you. It's the blood. It's that way or no way. Jesus said, if you try to come into heaven some other way, you're a thief and a robber. It's that way, the way. Jesus Christ, I, I quote this verse probably every service. Jesus Christ says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. I'm the way. Now can go any other way. Verse 7, If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Kind of a strange way to put it, but what he's talking about there, it's not a, I, I, I take that back. I, I, I misspoke. I don't mean to say it's a strange way to, to put it, but I had to study that out to understand exactly what God meant. And what God meant by that is, he says, if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. Sin's like a lion, and it's crouched outside your door, and you walk out there, it wants to pounce on you. It wants to get you. Sin wants to destroy you, Cain, and you're over here working, 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 and you're thinking you're doing really well, and sin's got you deceived. And sin's waiting at the door, and as soon as you walk out, it wants to pounce on you, and it wants to destroy you. But, he says, and, and to these shall be his desire, he wants to get you, and now shalt rule over him. But you can have the power over sin if you'll just do well. Christian, that speaks to each one of us in this room this morning. You're not a servant of sin anymore. You're a servant of righteousness. Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 8. Go home and read those chapters. You don't have to sin anymore. You have the ability to say, I cannot, I don't have to sin. I don't have to succumb to it. I can live in righteousness. How? Through Jesus Christ. I got the power through Jesus Christ. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. We don't have, sin is there. It wants to get you. It wants to pounce on you. Like a lion. The Bible says the lion, the, 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 the Satan as a lion, roaring lion, seeketh whom he may desire. Sin wants to get you, wants to destroy you, just like he wants to do Cain. But I want to point something out in verse 7. And it struck me while I was reading this again. God, we serve a really, and y'all know this, we serve a really, really generous, good God. And one of the attributes of God that I appreciate and I appreciate so much about God. I mean, don't get me wrong, but one of the main attributes of God that I really, really appreciate is his long-suffering. He's patient. Because I'm not a patient man. I'm an Irishman. I snap off like a firecracker. I'm not very patient. But God is very patient. 
And I wish I was more patient like God. And I, 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 I want to be more patient like God. And God's worked with me and put me through trials and tribulations to, to grow my patience. And I thank Him for that because I want to be more patient. I want to have the characteristics of my Heavenly Father, of Jesus Christ. But notice that He's long-suffering. He didn't have to tell Cain what was the problem. Notice, this is God. Amen? All He had to do was, Cain's not happy. You're dead. And just stomp him like a rat. Stomp him like an ant. Kill him. Knock him out. At the very least, he could have said, well, I don't care if Cain's happy or not. That's how it is. But God loves him and says, now listen, Cain. If you do well, if you do what's right, want everything go well, I'll accept you. Let's talk about this. That's your God. Sinners are going their own way. Sinners are enemies with God. Sinner, a sinner might hate God. You might be underneath the sound of my voice and you might say, I hate God. But you know what? God loves you. And he wants to have a relationship with you. How much does he love me? He loves you enough to die for you on a cross of Calvary while you're an enemy. He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to talk with Cain. He wants to reason with Cain. He wants to help Cain out. And he tries and it doesn't appear to have worked very well with Cain because Cain doesn't take God's advice. Like so many people in the world, they don't take God's word and they go off and live their own way. Verse 8, and bad things, bad things happen. Look at verse 8. And Cain talked with Abel his brother. Came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. First murder. Wasn't the first killing. The first death in the Bible was what? Have you thought about that? What's the first, what's the first death in the Bible? We just read it. It's that poor lamb that didn't do nothing and God killed it so they could be clothed. In their nakedness. The first thing to die was that lamb. To cover Adam and Eve. That's the first death. I'm here to tell you the last death of Jesus Christ on the cross. A lamb. Take away the sins of the world. The first death was that lamb. And now the first murder. Is Cain as he rises up. I want to point out that this way, this way of works through sweat, the sacrifice, this way right here of works through sweat, those people, the people that work through sweat, they hate the people of the blood through faith. It's been like that since the beginning of time. If you look through church history and you look through the history of the church, you look through the history of the world, the people that work and try to work their way to God, that try to be very religious, they're killers and murderers. Amen, amen, amen. I'll amen myself. If you haven't read church history, you haven't read history, go look it up. It's the church killing people. It's these religious people killing people. Killing them for God. I'm doing God a service. It was the Pharisees trying to kill Jesus. And they did kill Jesus. The difference is he rose on the third day, amen. But they killed him. They can't stand they're jealous and envious that they've been doing all this work. They've been trying to work their way to God with the rituals and their beads and their statues and their bowing down and all the works and going to church on a certain day and worshiping God a certain way. And they look over here and this is old poor sinner over here and says, I just trust the blood of Jesus Christ. And I'm saved. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I put my faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. What work are you going to do? I'm not going to do no work. They can't stand it. But that's how God wants it. You get it? And they're over here, and I don't blame them in the flesh. We're looking, look at that. They're taking care, they're taking care, they're taking care, they're not doing any work. There's old Abel, he's sitting under a tree taking a nap. I'm over here working, 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 getting up early in the morning. There he is, just walk, carrying around a bunch of sheep, just taking care of them, not doing much of anything. Oh, there might be a lion coming somewhere, and he just, hey, get away from me. He doesn't do much of anything. I'm over here just working, working, working my rear end off, and I look over there. Abel's doing nothing, but he's bringing the blood. He's bringing the blood. And God says, that's a more excellent sacrifice. That's the way. And Cain, like most of the world from the beginning of time, looks over there. They can't stand him. And he rises up and he kills Abel. In his jealousy and in his envy. Verse 9. And the Lord said unto Cain, where is Abel thy brother? God knows where Abel is. He wants Cain to confess it. See, sometimes y'all think God doesn't know. God asks the question. God asks questions like your mom did, like, 
Have you been in the cookie jar? No, Mama, I haven't been in the cookie jar. Or when Mom comes home, it's like, who left those dirty dishes in the sink? I didn't do it, Mama. She knows who left those dirty dishes in the sink. The Lord God knows who killed Abel. He knows exactly where Abel's at. But he wants Cain to confess it. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, Cain said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Yeah. yeah. You know what that should tell you? If you don't know already, this side over here, this side over here that does works through sweat to try to please God, they don't care about you. Not one bit. That's a hard pill to swallow. You mean I've been working all this? I've been doing all this? And, and No, they don't care about you. Oh, they say they do. They want you, but do them wrong and see what happens. Amen? How many people have been hurt in church by this side of the pulpit? How many people in church have been going to a church and some religious hypocrite did something to them? Amen? And it's, it's a hard pill to swallow. And why did it hurt your feelings so bad? Why did it make you want to leave the church? Why did you want to get away from God? Because it hurt you because you thought they loved you. This side that works, this side that's doing all that, they don't care nothing about you. They're just getting ready to be jealous and envious of you. You need to get over on the side that says, you know, I'm a wicked sinner, and I'm just going to trust the blood of Jesus Christ and get me to heaven. You know why? Because you, you can trust somebody like that because they're being honest with you. When somebody shows up and they're in their little suit like I am, maybe they got a collar that's turned around backwards and over there. It's like, oh, God bless you, my son. God bless you, my son. God bless you. You better turn, turn and run. You better turn and run. Jesus Christ described them as sheep in wolves' clothing. <laughs> exactly what they are. Sheep in wolves' clothing. Here's Cain rising. He murders Abel. I don't know where my brother's at. They don't care nothing about you. Verse 10, and he said, this is the Lord God, what hast thou done? You better confess it. What hast thou done? And the voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. The life of the flesh is in the blood. That blood was still talking. That blood was still speaking. That blood was down in the ground. Avenge me! I was righteous. He killed me. I did exactly what you told me to do. I brought you the blood. I did nothing wrong. Avenge me. Avenge me. I read that verse right there and it frightens me. It makes me tremble to think of America. In a country, I'm living in a country that's murdered millions of babies. Aborted the blood. The blood of millions of aborted babies lays on this ground of America, crying out to God, avenge me! Avenge me! I had no life! You gave me life and they took it! I had no chance! Avenge me! Avenge me! That blood crieth to God! The life of the flesh is in the blood! In America, ha 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 ha! Well, you know, that's so funny. We got a right to choose. You got a right to choose to bring judgment on God is what you're choosing to do. And Abel's blood was crying out to God. Avenge me. Verse 11. And now art thou cursed from the earth which hath opened up her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. Cain, you're trusting in those works of your sweat. You're trusting in that ground to bring forth fruit you think will please me. I'll curse the very ground you're trying to do. God's going to curse this very church if it gets away from the blood of Jesus Christ. God will, church, God will curse any church, any religion, any man, any woman that gets away from the blood of Jesus Christ. You're asking for a curse. God doesn't do it that way. God does it through the blood. He does it through the blood of Jesus Christ. You see what's wrong with the churches today? You go into the church and say, what's wrong with that church? Where's the blood? They've forgotten about the blood. They don't sing about the blood. They've forgotten all about the blood of Jesus Christ. And they wonder why they're sitting there under a curse. He said, I'm going to curse it. It won't yield to you what you want. Why can't we bring forth fruit? Why is the church so unfruitful? They've forgotten about the blood of Jesus Christ. 
a fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. Fugitive and a vagabond. Vagabond is somebody who just wanders for wandering. Just wanders just to wander. God says, you're going to be a fugitive. He's running from the law, amen. Running from the law, the Ten Commandments. Running from the law, God's law. He's a fugitive and he's a vagabond. He's just wandering to wander. So on this side, you have a fugitive wandering from the law, running from the law, and a vagabond who's just wandering to wander, a fugitive and a vagabond. And on this side, you got a stranger and a pilgrim. Abel was a stranger and a pilgrim. This ain't my home. I'm just a walking through. I'm on a pilgrimage to heaven. I'm a stranger in a strange land because I'm a pilgrim going to heaven. Amen, amen, amen. So in this morning, there's always been two sides. The workers that are, that are working, that are working through sweat, and then there's the ones that are bringing the blood through faith, and the workers that are working through sweat, they're fugitives, and they're vagabonds in God's eyes, and the blood through faith, we're strangers and pilgrims. Praise God. Verse 13, And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. You know what he deserved? Cain deserved? According to Genesis chapter 9, he deserved death. God said, Whoever sheds man's blood, that was how man, man shall shed his blood. You deserve, it's a cap, called capital punishment, what we don't do anymore. If you go and kill somebody, you deserve to be killed. If you shed blood, the only thing that's going to, God says in the Bible, the only thing that's going to help cover that blood of that man that shed is the man that shed that blood. It's blood for blood. That's why it's the precious blood of Jesus Christ that's going to cover your sins. It's not just the death. It's not just the teachings of the healings. It's, it, it's the blood. It's got to be the blood. That's why we sing about the blood. You get up in the Revelation. We've been preaching Revelation together. Have you noticed that in Revelation? What are they singing about up in Revelation? Oh, thank you, Lord, for the cross of Calvary. No, they're singing about we're washed in the blood of the Lamb. That's what they're singing. We're washed in the blood. We're saved by the blood. They're not singing about the cross. The cross is where the blood was shed. Let's get it right. It's the blood. Praise God. Verse 14. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. So everybody's going to be out to kill me. And they should... And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark, set a mark upon Cain, lest any find him should kill him. God, God marks him up. So they'll leave him alone. See, when you're working, your, when you're doing those works through sweat, you're going to take that mark. Revelation is called the mark of the beast. Take that mark. What God's doing there is something amazing. He's showing grace. Cain should have been killed. He killed Abel. He deserves to die. And God shows him grace. I'm here to tell you the worst sinner you know, and I don't know if you could picture the worst sinner you can think of. If it's Charles Manson, if it's Hitler, God's got grace for that sinner. Boy's getting quiet in here. God's got grace for that sinner. Yeah. Man, we've got too many self-righteous people in here. Too many self-righteous people. You don't think God's got grace for them? He got grace for you. Your sins aren't bad as theirs. You just hadn't lived long enough to get that done. <laughs> you didn't get to accomplish all you wanted to accomplish. Come on, be honest with yourself. Come on, just be honest with yourself one time. You ever thought about killing somebody? I mean, just on the heat of the moment, like, man, I wish I, I, I wish I had a gun, I'd shoot them. I wish I just, you, I don't care what it is. Think about if you could have accomplished what you wanted, had the power. Brothers and sisters, we're just one step away from being rotten, wicked sinners. It's only by the grace of God we're in this church this morning. 
Eduardo Moody was walking with our Stanky, his song leader. Eduardo Moody looked over there and there was an old beat, old drunk laying there in, in his own vomit and filth. And Eduardo Moody said, man, what a shame. What a shame. It was our Stanky. Our Stanky looked over there and our Stanky said to Eduardo Moody, look at that drunk. What a shame. And Eduardo Moody stopped and said, but by the grace of God, there go I. But by the grace of God, that's where I would be. Brothers and sisters, but by the grace of God, we're in this church this morning. We're sinners. We deserve death. But if by, by the blood of Jesus Christ, we would be in hell. Praise God. You know, it says there in verse 10, and I want to close. The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me. Abel's blood was crying, avenge me. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12 and close it. Hebrews chapter 12. Let's go back to Hebrews in closing. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Look at verse 24. Yeah, there's no doubt that Abel's blood was crying, Avenge me, avenge me. But look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24. We're closing right here. Closing these verses right here. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, look at this, that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Amen. You know what that blood of Jesus Christ speaks? The blood of Abel cried, Avenge me! Avenge me! And the blood of Jesus Christ cries, Forgive them. Forgive them. Forgive them. How do you know that, Pastor? Christ, hanging on the cross, crucified and whipped, almost about to die, says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That blood of Jesus Christ speaks better things than Abel's. Forgive them. Forgive them. Verse 25. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. Are you refusing the forgiveness that Jesus Christ has for you this morning? Maybe you've been walking in this world. Maybe you've been doing the works by sweat. I mean, you're working, you've been thinking, I'll, I'll just keep going to church and God, God will be happy with me. I'll just keep reading my Bible. I'll, just, I'll keep doing these religious things. I, I'll, I'll, I'll do these things and I'll, I'll give to the poor. I'll tithe. I'll keep doing, and you've been working for God and you're wondering why you don't feel right. You said, because you're getting away from the blood. And you're forgetting that the blood of Jesus Christ is what it's all about. It speaks better things. You don't want to refuse that blood that cries, forgive them, forgive them. Arise, my soul, arise. One of my favorite hymns. I know I talk about it a lot. In that hymn, he says, Arise, my soul, arise. Shake off your guilty fears. Five bleeding wounds he bears. Received on Calvary. They pour effectual prayers. They strongly plead for me. Forgive him, oh, forgive, they cry. Forgive him, oh, forgive, they cry. Nor let that ransom sinner die. When Jesus was shedding that blood, that blood was crying out to God, forgive them, forgive them. The Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for shedding that blood on the cross. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that it's by faith to the blood of Jesus.